Tonight we have Brother Roy Lanier, Jr., who will be speaking at this hour. Roy is so well known through the Brotherhood. He travels so extensively, full-time meeting work. There's so much we could say about Roy, but I uh, don't want to take much of his time except to say that we're happy to have him for 10 weeks of classroom training, 11 weeks total time because of the lectureship week here, with us here at Brown Trail in a special situation. He's teaching in the School of Preaching. He's teaching a, a night class in our North Texas School of Christian Development. And he's also teaching, will be teaching this beginning this next Wednesday night uh, in, here in the church, in the auditorium class. Roy is uh, the founding uh, editor of the Rocky Mountain Christian uh, News. That didn't sound right, is that right? Rocky Mountain News. Christian. Rocky Mountain Christian. <laughs> and uh, uh, has done a lot of writing. He's a Bible scholar. He's well equipped to handle the assignment given him tonight which is on the subject, Thy Kingdom Come, Brother Roy Lanier. But the only thing that Eddie said was right, that that didn't sound right. <laughs> and he has, he has finally come up with a good uh, description of his introductions. <laughs> <laughs> it is an honor to be here. I appreciate the honor that is mine to be asked to be on this program this year. I appreciate your presence here tonight. I appreciate all of the work and all of the planning and all of the participation that's here. Thursday night is really a tough night to speak. Thursday is the worst day to have the forum. You get all the leftovers and all the mess that Johnny Ramsey and all the others leave for you. And yet it's a real honor to be here. There's lots of teasing and joking that goes on and a lot of what we may say in-house jokes, I hope that some of you that are not preachers or preachers' wives may understand some of this mess, but nonetheless, we, we enjoy being here, and it's a real joy and an honor to be here. Jesus said in his early instructions to his disciples that they ought to pray after this manner, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I do not know many in this audience, but what know that prayer. Substance of it, may have memorized it. You certainly know the teachings of it. My assignment tonight is to deal with the phrase or with the idea, Thy kingdom come. I've been debating whether or not to go by the text. I've been debating whether or not to try to put all the material in that is involved in the manuscript that's in the book. I really don't think I can do that. I just don't believe Eddie will allow me the time. He's cut me off every way since, before. <laughs> And so if you can follow the outline backwards, beginning in the middle and going each way, we may try to cover a good bit of this material tonight. Now, first of all, there is a context that ought to be involved. You and I need to realize the context in which Jesus spoke. It's in the first year of his ministry. It's in the idea that for three years he's going to be in a period of work and preparation for the beginning of his kingdom. The context is spoken under or within the time frame of the law of Moses. All of the work of Jesus and all of the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell about the last three and a half years, perhaps, if you include the entire life of Christ, of course, 33 and a half years, that were the last few years of the time under which Israel still lived under the law of Moses. And the fact that Jesus was pointing towards something is involved in this context. He is pointing toward and preparing the coming of his kingdom. 
And so he is teaching his disciples to pray for the coming of that kingdom. Now, there is a word used here, which the scholars tell us means more than just the arrival of the kingdom. Had he been involved with just saying, pray that the kingdom will someday arrive, he would have used another word. We'll not go into the details of it. I don't know them very well, and they won't interest you anyway. Suffice it to say that it can easily be substantiated that the wording of this, according to the Greek scholars, would have been different had he simply been wanting to say, pray that the kingdom may finally arrive. But rather, a word is used here for our English word, come, thy kingdom come, that means not only the arrival, but the uh, entire scope of the effects of that arrival. That it means really thy kingdom come, but thy kingdom come with all of its scope and with all of its effects and with all of the result that will be there from its coming. Brother H. Leo Bowles made a marvelous statement about this, though brief in his commentary on the book of Matthew published by the Gospel Advocate Company and has been the model for many, many of us that at that time, they prayed for the coming of the kingdom. Now we pray for the expanding of it, for the continuance of it. Bloomfield made a beautiful statement along this line also with the idea, much the same, that it means not only the arrival of it, but the entire scope of it. Now, in its context, therefore, it would be doubtful that you and I ought to use the exact expression, thy kingdom come, unless we mean it in the sense of its expansion, its uh, fruition, and its glorification. I personally avoid the use of that phrase, thy kingdom come, because I do not understand, or I do not think, rather, that many within an audience before whom I might pray would understand it that way, though it is legitimate for us to use the English word that way. However, in its context, Jesus was praying for something then in the future. Living under the law of Moses, he thereby was praying for something to finally come. Now, Jesus promised that that was going to come. He said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus, therefore, is saying that he is going to build his church, future tense, singular, one church, and that they would be able to assist in this if they would use the keys of the kingdom. Now, he's speaking directly to Peter in Matthew 16, but in Matthew 18, speaking to all of the disciples, verse 1, in verse 18, he points out that all of them will be binding and loosing, and this was the very thing that he gave to Peter to do with the keys in the 16th chapter. So if Peter, using the keys, would be binding and loosing, then when all of the apostles would be binding and loosing, they also must have been using the keys. Very simple logic, but irrefutable. You cannot take Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 together without realizing that all the apostles had the keys of the kingdom because all of them had the power to loose and bind. Now then, that will be a key point a little bit later on, if I can remember it. So just tuck that away for a moment. The word king simply means ruler. The word kingdom simply means the ones that are ruled. It means a reign, a sovereignty, a rule. That's all literally that this word implies in just its basic use. Now there are three or four things you and I need to realize about the Bible use of the term kingdom. First of all, it of course can be used to refer to any a political kingdom. You can read throughout many passages of the Old Testament concerning kingdoms. There was the kingdom of Israel. There was the kingdom of Babylon. There was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. There was the kingdom of Sihon, even way back in the book of Genesis. And the word kingdom simply referred to a political sovereignty, reign, or rule. That's all it referred to. And it was a political, a national situation. Now sometimes the word kingdom can be used to refer in a very special way to Israel because it was a special kingdom over which God had in a sense a theocratic rule. Then there are simply the terms kingdom 
that can refer to the special spiritual relationship of God in reference to Jesus being our king. Now when the term kingdom is used in that special spiritual relationship, Peter was given the keys of the kingdom. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come. We realize that they went throughout preaching, as did John the Baptist, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark 1, 4, he preached a baptism of repentance under remission of sins in order to be in the preparatory work of that kingdom. Remember in Matthew 10 that he sent his 12 out with a limited temporary use of the Holy Spirit. He told them to heal the sick, to cast out the demons. In Luke 10, Matthew 12, I believe also, 70 were sent out two by two. And when they came back, they rejoiced, you see, that even the demons were subject to us. Temporary, limited powers of the Holy Spirit were given to these people in order that they might be able to preach the coming of the kingdom and that people should repent in order to prepare for the coming of the Messiah, the King. Now then, Jesus said you need to rejoice more that your names are written in heaven than whether or not the demons are subject to you. But in these temporary times, we're, we have these two situations where the apostles were sent out and where the 70 were sent out preaching the good news of this kingdom and its coming. I think it would be fair to infer that this was not the only time that these were sent. That at various times it seems that the apostles also went in and out during this three year period. Nonetheless, it was preached by John the Baptist as long as he lived. It continued to be preached by Jesus and his disciples and his apostles, his chosen twelve, all of these three and a half years, the kingdom was coming. Now then, the word kingdom in its spiritual sense, referring to Jesus Christ, may I suggest has at least three uses in the Bible. Besides the word kingdom having some political usages, it has some distinctions that you and I need to make in regard to the spiritual uses. First of all, God is king over all the universe. Psalms 47 Psalms 48, Psalms 147 and 145, there are multitudes of passages that speak about Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Let the nations rejoice and sing of thy sovereignty. On and on and on would go the passages concerning that God rules over everything he's ever created. Well, he has ruled since creation. He continues to rule among the nations. Why, the prophets are replete with examples. Isaiah speaks two and three hundred years ahead of time about the fall of Babylon, about the rebuilding of the temple. Nineveh and Assyria were spared, though Nahum spoke about them. And finally, they were destroyed in 606 by the coming of the Babylonish powers. And in all of these things, it shows that God rules among the nations. We're speaking about political nations. We're speaking about the day-by-day -day activities. God rules over everything he's ever created. And the Bible so declares this to be. Isn't it interesting that in Matthew 13, Jesus said that God would gather out of his kingdom those that would be able to go to heaven. And yet that kingdom was the world. That wasn't the church. But rather he was gathering out of the world. I think you and I can understand it a little bit better if we understand it that way. I'm not sure that you and I can prove that without any shadow of a doubt, but it certainly does fit with the idea of God's reign over all the universe, all the world, everything he's ever created. God rules and reigns in the lives and hearts of people and has ever since creation. And the Bible uses it that way, the kingdom of God. But secondly, the kingdom of God is used in a very special sense in reference to Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks about his kingdom. John prepared for the coming of that kingdom. The Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Daniel, Micah, spoke about the coming of that rule and of that kingdom, and that there would be no end of it. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Isaiah 2, we have this full of the idea of the coming of the Messiah and his reign. Zechariah spoke about that great king that would sit and rule upon the throne and be a priest upon the throne, Zechariah 6.13. On and on go all of these passages of the expected coming of the Messiah to sit and rule on David's throne in his kingdom. Second Samuel 7, 
God gave a special promise to David that he, out of the fruit of his loins, would have one to sit upon his throne and he would reign forever and ever. So even though God was ruling and reigning over the universe, the Old Testament began to sow these thoughts and ideas that there is yet a sense in which there's a kingdom coming. It's the Messiah's kingdom. It's the rule and reign of the blessed anointed one. It is called the throne of David. It's referred to as the tabernacle of David in Amos 9 and Acts 15 concerning its fulfillment. And there are many different ways that this is spoken about, but it's still a sense in which it is not the universal reign of God over all that he's created. In that universal reign over all that God has created, he rules among the nations. He rules indiscriminately among those who belong to him and those who don't in a, spi in a spiritual sense. However, this second use of the word kingdom refers to that kingdom of that seed of David, that Messiah, that anointed one, that great messianic kingdom. Well, then there is a third way that this word kingdom is used, and that has reference to the eternal abode where God will rule and reign supremely. In Matthew 25, Jesus is telling those that they would inherit the kingdom prepared for them. In 2 Peter 1, Thus shall be richly supplied unto you an abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom. There is yet a kingdom to come, ladies and gentlemen, in a sense, and perhaps the mystery will be easily cleared up if we look at 1 Corinthians 15, because he said, Then cometh the end, or, or he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be abolished is death, and he will deliver up the kingdom unto God, even the Father. And then he will subject himself back unto the Father that all may be in all. Is this a time, as Zechariah 9 speaks about, that he shall be one and his name shall be one? There is a sense, therefore, in which heaven is referred to as the eternal kingdom of God. Now, that we uh, have many instances of this in the teaching of Christ, I have pointed out in the book, but we'll not go into detail at this time because of time. But recognize these three ideas. God's kingdom sometimes refers to his rule and reign over all the creation. Irrespective of people's response to him, he rules and reigns among all peoples of all times, everywhere, even political situations, and in every situation, God rules and reigns over the universe. Secondly, God rules and reigns in the sense of a mediatorial reign of Jesus Christ, the Messiah's kingdom, the anointed one, the seed of David, David's throne. And thirdly, God rules and reigns in a kingdom in the sense of the eternity the kingdom of God that can be inherited by you and me for all eternity. Heaven, if you please. The kingdom of creation, the kingdom of grace, and the kingdom of glory, I believe is the way Benjamin Franklin referred to it in one of his great sermons, old pioneer type sermons, and that's a good idea. These distinctions ought to be made. Now then, note, these are not three different kingdoms. Not at all. They are simply one rule and reign of God. That's all but that you and I might see three distinctions involved in it. They are not three separate kingdoms. They are simply the kingdom of God expressed in these three relationships. And You and I have uh, ample biblical, scriptural ideas that, th that we do have these three relationships. Now, has this kingdom of God begun? That is, the mediatorial reign of Christ on this earth. Has it begun? Well, Peter certainly was fooled if it had not been begun, what did he preach? He preached the fulfillment of the promise to King David in Acts 2. He alluded to that, he referred to that, he quoted from that. He said, we have our father David in his tomb with us till this day. But he, being a prophet of God, uh, had an oath sworn to him, or was promised to him with an oath, that of the fruit of his loins he would set one upon his throne. And he, foreseeing this, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that neither was his soul left under Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now Peter is preaching that David's promise by God to him that a Messiah would come 
out of his loins was fulfilled at the resurrection of Christ. There is a distinction, ladies and gentlemen, between the time Jesus taught personally and the time he was resurrected. When was it that Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me? Matthew 28, 18 and 19. When was it that he said that? After his resurrection. Ephesians 1 indicates that there was given to be head over all things, put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He therefore assumed an authority after his resurrection. And Peter suggested that he is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. Now to you and me, right hand may not mean much. You know what it meant to the Jews? That was a very significant phrase to the Jews. The right hand of the throne of the majesty on high referred to the seat of the Messiah. That's where the Messiah was to sit when he ruled in his kingdom. And there was no mistake about that. Peter used that. In Acts 3, he repeated a number of these promises where he spoke about they had killed the prince of life and the holy one. Why, those were terms pregnant with meaning to these Jewish people. Unless you and I realize some of these Jewish backgrounds from under the law of Moses, we don't realize what that meant. But Peter was saying, the one you've been looking for as the Messiah has now come. That's what he preached to him in Acts 2 and in Acts 3. And it's always been a puzzle to me that we don't understand the use of the word Christ. Christ was never his name. It still is not his name. We use Jesus Christ. We bandy that about so much that we sometimes think his name was Jesus Christ. Well, no, Matthew 1. The angel said that his name would be Jesus, so far as a name, but one of the titles is Christ, just one of them. Because Peter said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made him both Lord and Christ. It's just as correct to say Jesus Lord as it is to say Jesus Christ. Lord meaning master, Christ means the anointed one. It's the New Testament. Counterpart of the Old Testament word Messiah. Messiah in the Old Testament, Christ in the New. There's no difference. It's a difference in the Hebrew language and the Greek language is all. If Jesus was made to be the Christ, he was made to be the anointed one. There's not a denominational preacher in this town that can consistently call him the Christ unless they believe he is now seated at the right hand of God and on David's throne. Just can't do it. And all of the ignorance that's filling the pulpits of the world today, speaking of him as Jesus the Christ, and yet looking sometime in the future for him to come in a millennial kingdom. It cannot be. If he is the Christ today, then he is functioning as the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's on David's throne. Well, how do we know that it has begun? Peter not only preached it, but Paul preached it. He said, we've been translated in the kingdom of the Son of His love. Colossians 1. He referred to the fact that we ought not to be fussing and feuding over these things about eating and dietary habits in Romans 14. For he said, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy. He said as a standard of judgment for their actions day by day because they were in the kingdom and they ought to act like citizens of the kingdom. Paul spoke about citizenship being in heaven, Philippians 3. Paul spoke about Christ reigning until death is no more and then delivering up the kingdom, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul speaks about this kingdom, if he be the writer of Hebrews 12, receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, whereby we may have grace that we may offer service well pleasing unto God with reverence and awe. And in that same context, I believe about verse 23, he's talked about the church of the firstborn one. And he uses these interchangeably. Church of the firstborn ones and the kingdom. Check it out, Hebrews 12. Well, that's like Jesus used the term church and kingdom interchangeably. Or else he built one thing and gave Peter the keys to, to open the doors or something else. Why, well, how foolish that would be. He said, I'm going to build a church and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. That you can do it. Well, when did the kingdom begin? It began when they began to exercise that authority and use the keys of the kingdom. What were they to do with the keys of the kingdom? Bind and loose. Bind and loose. When did the apostles begin to bind and loose? When they were empowered to do so. When were they empowered to do so? He said, well, wait till you be empowered from on high. Acts 1. 
And then you can be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. It'll come when the Holy Spirit comes to you. So Acts 2, the Spirit came. They began to speak in other tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. And thereby the fulfillment of John 14, John 16, that the other comforter has now come. And thereby the fulfillment that he will bring to their memory all that I said unto you. And that he will teach you all things. Oh yes, the power for them to function now as apostles has come. Therefore being empowered, they can do the work of apostles and they began to bind and loose. What's the first thing they bound? Repent. <laughs> What's the second thing they bound? Be baptized for the remission of sins. Or you might want to say believe on the Lord Jesus. Perhaps might be the first thing because that's what Peter was trying to get them to do. But they began to bind and loose. What was loosed? Well, their sins were going to be loosed or remitted. They now could bind and loose because they were empowered by inspiration. It was not their idea. They were simply doing that which... They were empowered to do what Jesus had promised to do when the Holy Spirit came as the paraclete, the other comforter. Now, when did the kingdom begin? The kingdom had to begin with two or three maybe overlooked things. Well, I forgot a little bit. John said he was a brother in the kingdom. Didn't he? Revelation 1. And in the tribulation, verse 9. Paul said he's fellow workers in, in the kingdom. Colossians 4.10. On and on and on go the the usages of the term kingdom in the present sense. The mediatorial kingdom, therefore, must have been in operation even in New Testament days. It's synonymous to saying someone is in the church. You look at it one way, the Bible calls it the church. You look at it from the idea of rule and reign, it's the kingdom. You look at it in another way, it can be the vineyard. You look at it another way, it can be the family. They're all the same. You draw your circles around them and every one of them is exactly the same. Well, when did the kingdom begin? It began, folks, when they quit preaching, the kingdom was coming. It quit preaching. You see, they did quit preaching that the kingdom was coming, didn't they? How long did they preach that? About three years, three and a half years. You never find them preaching that the kingdom is coming. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They quit that kind of preaching when Jesus died and never preached again. Why? I think it's very simple. The kingdom must be in operation. Secondly, another obscure passage, maybe not really an obscure passage, but an obscure application of a great passage. Jesus promised a man who came to him by night that if he would be born again, he could see the kingdom of God. That puzzled Nicodemus. And he asked about it, so Jesus repeated the idea. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except one be born of the water of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What puts one into the kingdom? The birth of the water and the Spirit. Now stay with me. What did Peter say that they had experienced? 1 Peter 1. Having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, through the word of God which liveth and abideth. He reminded them of their begettal again. But if they had been begotten again, that refers to the beautiful figure of the new birth, if they were Christians and had been born again, then into what had they been born? Into what had they been able to enter? Jesus said that when the new birth was to be practiced, it would put people in the kingdom. And if these people had been born again, they must have been in the kingdom. You put John 3 and 1 Peter 1 together and you just can't miss it. The kingdom began when they quit preaching that the kingdom was at hand. The kingdom began... When the new birth began to be practiced. Why I've never heard anybody brag so much about being born again, born again, born again, born again. And they use uh, not only that many repetitions, but they use it uh, even in their own expression. A born again Christian. How many times have you heard that on the TV? I'm a born again Christian, born again Christian. They don't even know what they're talking about. And yet they're the very ones that preach the kingdom is yet coming. They could not have experienced the new birth if the kingdom had not come. Because being born again puts one into the kingdom. There's a third obscure passage. I don't think I even have this in the book. So you might ought to take note of it. And that is, no Gentile is welcome in the kingdom or welcomed by God unless it is uh, the kingdom. Amos made this proposition in Amos 9 that when the tabernacle of David was built again, then the nations would come unto God. And when they had that problem about circumcision, they finally settled that in Acts, the 15th chapter. 
I want you to realize that one of the proof texts that they use, and I like proof, pre uh, proof text preaching. <laughs> After all, that's the way uh, they preached it in New Testament days. Peter preached it in Acts 2 and Acts 3. And here in Acts 15, why James was preaching it. And he pointed out that the tabernacle of David was the key to whether or not Gentiles would be welcome. And he preached that it was fulfilled. Now if the time, and of course, again, here is one of those great terms that you and I may not realize unless we know a little bit about Jewish understanding. The Jews understood the tabernacle of David referred to the kingdom of the Messiah. No doubt about it. That's what it meant to them. So it's saying that whenever the Messiah comes in his kingdom, the Gentiles will be welcome. James said Gentiles are welcome because the tabernacle of David the Messiah's kingdom is in operation. He said Amos 9 had been fulfilled. Check it out in Acts 15. So thereby the mediatorial kingdom must have begun on that great Pentecost following the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Oh, there's so many other arguments about this. Jesus said the kingdom of God would come in the days of some of those people standing there, Mark 9, 1. It would come with power. Then he told them in Acts 1, 8, that the Holy Spirit would come and give them that power. So I know that the kingdom was going to come when the power came, Mark 9, 1. The kingdom was going to come when, the, I mean, the power would come when the Holy Spirit came, Acts 1, 8. You put it all together, it just simply says that when these men were empowered by the Holy Spirit to go do the work of apostles, that would signal not just the coming of the Holy Spirit, but also the beginning of the operation of the kingdom, the mediatorial kingdom of Jesus Christ. And one of these days, it will be merged back up into glory. It's not a separate kingdom. There is a distinction where we can make these fine points of distinction, but God has always ruled over all creation. Christ has established a special rule in the hearts of those that are believers, obedient to his call, and that will be merged back into glory for the everlasting rule and reign and sovereignty of God or kingdom of God that will never, never end. Thy kingdom come? Yes, those people evidently were praying for it in that day. And it came. But thy kingdom come can also understand to be meant not only the arrival of it, but the entire effects of it after it has arrived. Now there are those who say that the mediatorial kingdom, the Messiah's kingdom, is not here today. Isn't that strange? Jesus' work was thwarted by a little group of Jews there in Palestine. You believe that? The work of the apostles was thwarted. The purpose for all the training of the apostles was twisted, taken down, buttressed against, not able to be done. Look at all of the things that will have to happen. Why, well, Rome's going to have to be reestablished. Many things about the physical kingdom of Israel and the land of Palestine will have to be reestablished. There's so many of these things, it just makes a mockery. There is another way to say it, ladies and gentlemen, and that is that the kingdom of our Lord and of our God is here. When he rules and reigns in your heart and in my heart, and we obey his word and we are born again, it is into the rule, the sovereignty, the reign of the Messiah on this earth. And oh, I love thy kingdom, Lord. Do you? Thank you. Thank you, Roy, for a tremendous explanation of the kingdom. I hope that all of us have a better understanding and deeper appreciation for what it means when we refer to the kingdom. ...in keeping the congregation in the dark. Keep them informed. Brother Gibson, in his great book that now I suppose is 30 or 35 years old, made a fine statement when he said there's something wrong with a congregation that doesn't want to hear from its eldership occasionally. Elders ought to say something to the congregation. Build them up, encourage them, warn them, whatever. Challenge them. Rebuke them when it's needed. He said also there's something wrong with an elder that doesn't occasionally desire to say something to that congregation that he has the spiritual charge concerning. These are some problem areas. We've dealt with problem areas, but the main thrust of the lesson was 
the eldership ordained of God, they have their work to do. A part of their work is indeed oversight, authority, rule. And I really believe that no one finds any fault with that except those who are going to find fault with the Word of God. They who themselves are sinful and they who themselves are not respective of authority. Should the eldership be a problem? No. It's a great boon and a blessing when they indeed function. A great boon and a blessing to the family of God. This discussion that he had written before, he ties it in into this chapter 12 by saying, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies, in other words, the grace of God that he'd already been writing on, to present, same word as back in chapter 6, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Not spiritual service, it's logicon, reasonable, not pneumaticon, your reasonable service, not worship but service. And both here in Romans 12, 1, and in Romans 6 and verse 13, the verbs are erist, a one-time point action. Turn yourselves over to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Dedicate yourselves. Come to the Lord and be converted. This is the idea that is being expressed by Paul in this particular passage. Much more we need to say on the subject of worship, but time fails us. I hope you will read the chapter in the book for much more is presented there as to what constitutes worship, whether it was revolutionized in the Christian age by Jesus' statement to the Samaritan woman, or whether he simply eliminated the holy place, and what constitutes the acts of worship for us today. I thank you so much for your attention.